All right, hello everybody. As you are joining us this afternoon, uh, we are asking that everybody keep their microphones on mute. That way we can get through as many of the questions as we can as possible without any background noise. Um, and what we're also gonna ask you to do is all the questions that you have, we're gonna ask that you put in the chat function and we will get to each of those questions. So we're gonna start out with about 20 minutes on VA benefits, claims and appeals, then about 20 minutes on VA healthcare and healthcare related issues. And then we'll spend the last 20 minutes on whatever else we have that comes our way or any additional comments that we need. So I wanna thank you first for all joining us this afternoon. And if we were at midwinter like we would normally be, we would be having conversations with all of you throughout the hotel, in the hallways, in between meetings, uh, maybe in the bar, I, I mean the restaurant, maybe in the restaurant we'd be having conversations when we'd run into each other, uh, or even on Capitol Hill. So since we're kind of missing that interaction with all of you, this was a great idea by Peter that we have this little time uh, during our normal midwinter weekend to invite questions from all of you that you may have on our critical policy goals, any other issues or questions that you may have. So it's just an opportunity for all of us to get together, uh, share information, answer your questions, and make it almost feel like that we're together uh, in DC. And before we get rolling, I wanna thank um, everybody for their BPTL contributions and recognize those winners that are with us from the uh, Outstanding Advocacy Awards. And I believe that is Mr. Jim Shuey in Nebraska is with us. Mr. Wilner in South Carolina is with us. And I'm not sure if I see anybody of the other departments with us, but- yep. Al, Al is here, Al LaBelle, I saw. Oh, well, we just always know Al can win. We don't even bother recognizing Al LaBelle in Wisconsin. I mean, geez, it's kind of like an algebraic given. So why don't we go ahead and get this show rolling? So again, please put your questions in the chat function and we are going to get to them. And before we do, let me just make sure everybody knows who's who with us today. Um, as you know, uh, Joy Elam, our Legislative Director for DAV, Jeremy Villanueva, Assistant Legislative Director, Ashley Burns, uh, Deputy Communications Director. She's helped us on women veterans issues as well as caregiver. And with us is Peter Dickinson, Senior Executive Advisor. Unfortunately, a member of our staff is not with us this afternoon and that is Marquis Barefield. He had a family uh, emergency and wasn't able to be with us this weekend. So we can go ahead and get this show on the road and start by answering any questions that you may have in reference to benefits related issues or any of our critical policy goals. And I've already got a few questions. Um, let me make sure I find them. So once again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat box. We're gonna keep the microphones turned off, but it looks like one of the first questions we have is a benefits related question. And Jeremy, I believe this question is for you. And this is, how can Congress and DAV address the spike of veteran unemployment that our nation has currently seen caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? Jeremy? Hey, uh, morning, every, or afternoon, everybody. Usually used to doing these in the morning. Um, thanks, you. that's actually a really good question. Uh, first, you know, let me say, you know, hello to everybody that's here. Uh, hey, Deb, I know I didn't do this last time, but there you go, okay. It's uh, ginger ale because it's Lent, but you get the idea. So, well, that is that is actually a good question. And there's a couple things. Uh, first of all, with Congress, um, since we've seen this, this COVID, this pandemic related spike in uh, veteran unemployment, there's been a few things that, that have gone on. Uh, there's been, of course, you know, when it comes to some of the uh, re uh, the employment uh, training and employment services that VA has, like the Army, there's been a, a hold placed on um, delivering dates. 
But there's also, if anybody's reacted, and I hope everybody's signed up to the Commander's Action Network, but has anybody reacted, if anybody's reacted to the latest uh, alert that we sent out, which was about uh, essentially the rapid retraining program that Congress is trying to get started. Now we had high hopes for it last Congress, got really close to passing and be put out there, which would be a retraining program. Hey, Bluetooth uh, are not eligible for any other uh, uh, either education or employment services and would get them, and were unemployed because of the coronavirus pandemic uh, that that would get them back to work so that's something that congress has, has been working on uh, as for dav you know uh, immediately and I, I i can't say and I, I know i'm biased but i've been haven't been more proud with how quickly dav started up the uh uh, the COVID relief program, the COVID, the unemployment COVID relief program that we did do. Um, and I wish I could give you better numbers, but that's for the service department. But on the legislative side uh, of, of the many things that we've been pushing for is that a permanent removal for the delimiting date for VRNE services for those uh, service disabled veterans. And the reason for that is that a lot of these veterans who, you know, are going to be unemployed are going to be seriously disabled. Um, and a lot of those uh, employers that are going to be shuttered are going to be ones that have provided what we would call, you know, sheltered employment for these seriously disabled veterans. And the, they're going to need help, not just any retraining, but retraining that focuses and takes into account their service uh, connected disabilities. And we believe that if they uh, just remove the delimiting date and open up what is already stood up a program that's already set up and has shown success um, that we could help uh, more specifically service disabled veterans and immediately. So that's some of the things that we've been looking at. That's awesome, Jeremy. Thank you. And actually I have, we've got another question uh, for you. And the question is what can we do to help spouses for entitlement to their uh, to the DIC benefits? If the death certificates only list the cause of death as COVID-19, um, is there any anything going on in reference to that issue? Again, uh, you know, that's um, that's a really good question and something that we've been uh, focusing in on um, and really, you know, trying to point out to, to Congress from the beginning is that, you know, one of the, the issues that will arise and that they should have looked for um, is that a lot of these harried um, doctors who, you know, these hospitals are overwhelmed and that when someone passes away from coronavirus, they're just going to put on their coronavirus and not have some of the, the uh, some of the other factors being their service connected disabilities. So that is a good call. And that is something that we brought forward to Congress. Uh, so Senator, Senator Sinema's office was pretty proactive in this and they released, and I wish I had the bill number in front of me, but also one of the alerts that we sent out, which was uh, ensuring veterans um, survivors benefits act. And what that will do is essentially that will, um, you know, make the VA provide a medical opinion to every service disabled veteran who passes away due to the coronavirus to list whether or not any of their service connected disabilities, uh, in fact, were contributory to their, to their cause of death cause of death. We're really hopeful there's been a couple of packages that that might have been a part of and we're still hopeful that'll get passed sometime during this um, during this Congress. Now I would always say if you haven't done it already please share like share that alert, react to that alert, send it around and understand how important this is. Now that's to get that passed. If there is somebody that you know of that has um, a member of their family who has passed away due to the coronavirus um and they were they did have service connected disabilities especially vietnam veteran um era you know uh veterans who were exposed to agent orange i would definitely have them and have them talk to a dav nso or any nso to see and talk them through their um their options and seeing whether or not they can get their their doctor to amend that death certificate to list whether they had diabetes or high blood pressure or any lung condition that was caused by uh, Agent Orange. So that, that would be my rambling, you know, um, opinion. Right, and thanks, Jeremy. And that's one thing to remember, if it's just COVID-19 on the death certificate, I can't stress this enough. The death certificate does not need to say the service-connected disability cause of death. You can get a 
medical opinion from the physician. So don't think we have to change the death certificate because those are a little bit more complicated to get amended. So these are some of the other things that you can try to do until we get this piece of legislation hopefully passed that will automatically make them look at a medical opinion for cause of death with COVID-19 is to work with their uh, physicians, with the surviving spouse to see if we can get a medical opinion that their service-connected conditions cause or aggravated death. And those are kind of the key phrases we're gonna look for. So for those of you who have just joined us over the last few minutes, what we're doing is just a little Q&A. We're asking you that you put your questions in the chat box. We're gonna spend the first 20 minutes or so on claims and benefits, and then we're gonna switch over to healthcare. So I'm just gonna be addressing some of the questions specific to uh, service connection and claims and appeals for the first few minutes, and then we'll work on the other ones. Um, somebody asked if there is still money left in the COVID-19 relief fund, and I just wanna get that out there right away because I'm not exactly sure what that means. So let me just explain it in two ways. One, there's the DAV COVID relief fund for unemployed veterans. There's still money available for veterans to apply for the $250 grant through DAV's COVID relief for unemployment. Go right to the DAV website, and there's a link on there for you to access that. Now, the other COVID relief packages that DHA received, there's still money there, but we'll, we'll talk about that secondarily. I, I want to focus on uh, benefits real quick. And that is uh, the toxic exposure space. Um, we got a question in reference to what is currently going on with everything. Now, I hope everybody saw our critical policy goals that were posted to the website as well as watch the videos. So I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail, but somebody asked, what about all current pending legislation or is there any new legislation for toxic exposures? And here's one of the great things that is coming up in reference to burn pits exposure, DAV's unique bill, uh, Veterans Burn Pit Exposure Recognition Act will be introduced uh, in this Congress within the next two weeks from Senators Manchin and Senator Sullivan. So that's forthcoming. In reference to K2 veterans, veterans who served at Kashi Khan Kanabad in Uzbekistan between 2001 and 2005, they were exposed to toxins as well. Senator Blumenthal is reintroducing a bill very soon. We just saw a draft version of it that is to point to presumptive service connection and healthcare benefits specifically for K-2 veterans. The Senate Veterans Affairs Committee also shared with us a draft piece of legislation to add hypertension as one of the presumptive diseases for Agent Orange. As you are aware of, we did get a huge win in the NDA last year, adding hyperthyroidism, bladder cancer, and Parkinson'sism related. We still have, in my opinion, two diseases left, hypertension and MGUS, monoglomo, uh, mono clonal gammopathy of unspecified origin. But those are two that we're working on. There is legislation that's going to be coming on that, as well as Senator Tillis will be introducing the team bill again this year. Senator Gillibrand will be introducing a presumptive benefits and diseases for uh, burn pits as well. So there's a lot of movement of things coming and will be introduced over the next several weeks. So I just want to make sure everybody is aware that all of this toxic exposure legislation is coming very soon for the new Congress. Just reading through some of the questions, bear with me here. I wanna make sure I deal with the service connection issues. Uh, and one is, I believe we got, what is the Indian Congress doing to improve tribal and rural veterans with their submission of their benefits claims to VA. Actually, there has been in the works legislation for a very long time, as well as several organizations are recognizing tribal service officers, very similar to like DAV chapter service officers. They are trying to get tribal service officers as a whole, as basically their own recognized POA entity across the board to help assist tribal service officers. And also they're looking into cross accrediting them with other major organizations 
to make it easier access for them to get claims training and access to assist those with those benefits. All right, I didn't see anything else very specific to um, service connection claims and benefits. So we're going to switch a little bit over to healthcare real quick. And this is a, a big one. And Peter, I believe this one is going to be you. And that is, what is DAV doing in reference to all of the deaths at VA nursing homes due to COVID-19? Uh, thanks. That's obviously an important question. Uh, VA, which provides long-term care support to veterans through three different ways, I think, as most of you know. VA runs itself nursing homes. They're called Community Living Centers, or CLCs. VA supports state veteran homes, which actually provide most of the institutional long-term care um, that they provide by providing partial support, and the state provides partial support. And VA provides uh, support to veterans who are able to go to contract community nursing homes. Now, we shouldn't be surprised when we look at the pandemic, particularly early on, that most of the deaths we're aware from COVID come to elderly people with underlying uh, and chronic conditions, and that they uh, more frequently uh, have negative outcomes for men than women. So essentially, you've described the population in nursing homes for veterans, which are predominantly men, very aged, and have significant comorbid conditions. So uh, early on, of course, there was a lot of um, uh, deaths that occurred in a number of places, both in community nursing homes as well as state veteran homes. The VA's community living centers fared better in large part because they're often attached to VA medical centers. They actually have a much higher standard of care because of that. For example, they have oxygen lines very often running right into their rooms or able to do a lot of things. So the CLCs have been a, a much, uh, done, fared much better throughout. Uh, the problem with other nursing homes, whether they're state veteran homes or community homes is it is impossible to keep COVID essentially out of any place. And a lot of those facilities, um, particularly the older ones are built with multiple people in a room. Many of them also have dementia wards and it's very hard to try to get people to, to stay within a room. So um, there's a couple of things that have gone on. Um, they all have, of course, uh, followed the guidelines, both from CDC, uh, from CMS, from VA, all of the facilities. Uh, there has been a greater uh, look at reporting requirements um, from particularly state veteran homes to get the data. Uh, Congress has provided some significant support uh, they provided $150 million to help with emergency COVID grants last year, something we supported. Uh, some uh, facilities were able to apply for those grants to use them for things like negative pressure rooms, again, running, as I mentioned, oxygen lines um, and other ways. Congress also, at the end of last year, uh, provided $100 million to support the operations. Now, for the state veteran homes in particular, um, as they were uh, frozen from admitting new veterans, uh, during COVID, uh, they not only had their numbers going down as their uh, people did pass away, both from COVID and other causes, because of course that is what happens in long-term care facilities. They're often people's final resting places where they go. So they not only had increased costs of COVID protection they had to uh, address, but they also had a loss of the federal support that comes based on a per diem basis. So Congress in the new COVID relief bill that they're now considering, and you've heard about this one. This is the large package. They talked about $1.9 trillion, $2 trillion. It does have within it an effort to provide greater support to state veteran homes in particular, $500 million for the grant program that helps support state home construction, and $250 million to, again, make sure that the state homes don't um, suffer financially and therefore have to cut back on the number of veterans that they're willing to help. So DAV has been in contact regularly with VA and the long-term care programs, with the state veteran homes uh, directly themselves. Um, and we've certainly talked to the VHA about the community living centers. I think what's important to remember is you're, you are going to see more deaths in a location where the, the most vulnerable population is. Now, there were some extreme examples. Obviously, Holyoke in Massachusetts is the, the one that's out there. There's a broad investigation going on there. 
um, so that uh, we, we do need to understand that um, what the situation is. It's impossible to keep it out. We couldn't keep it out of the most secure facilities in the country from the White House or anywhere else. Um, you can't keep it out of any facility, but in the long term, one of the lessons we'll have to learn is how to build long term care facilities. Uh, I don't think they're going to build any facilities with four people to a room in the future. Um, so there's a lot of that type of thinking going on. Thank you, Peter. And before we get into another healthcare question, I know there's a little bit of this in the chat box. So I'm going to clear it up about resolutions. I'm going to make this as clear as I can. All the resolutions we currently use are resolutions that were passed at the last national convention we had. Upcoming, for the upcoming convention, hopefully that we're going to be having in Reno in 2021, we'll only be able to consider resolutions that were passed by your department. So long short answer is, if your department does not have a department convention to approve resolutions, they cannot be considered at the national convention. So if your department does have a convention and does approve resolutions to go to the national convention, they will be considered for the upcoming year. But again, if your department does not have a convention, it cannot approve resolutions to be considered at national convention. So I hope I cleared that up a little bit for everybody. Enjoy. We got a question I believe specific for you. And that is what is, be, what is being done to get community care doctors access to veterans medical records from the VA medical center. Thanks Shane. So one of the issues as you know that VA is um, dealing with right now during this transition period with their electronic health record, um, their scheduling package, all of the IT changes that they're uh, working on is to make sure that there's that interface. Um, with community care providers. Some uh, facilities right now, you know, still are not able to do that um, electronically. I know in most cases, for example, if you get referred out, most uh, facilities now have a community care office that handles all, you know, making those appointments, getting your medical records to the clinical person who you're going to see in their network or community and getting those back. Um, they're doing it in a variety of ways and it is different in various uh, facilities. But the goal is through DIT is to have that ability to do that electronically. Um, I don't think that's gonna be, you know, in the near future, um, you know, as they're just starting to roll out some of the electronic health record, um, you know, in one part of the, uh, you know, in the Vizen, um, in the North uh, West, um, but we don't know yet how that rollout's exactly gonna go. There was just a GAO report. There's been some, you know, issues, but we're getting briefings on that, but certainly it's an issue that, you know, we're keeping an eye on. That's the goal to make it as seamless as possible when someone does have to go out in the to get care in the community and that those records can, you know, go back and forth between VA and the community. Thank you very much, Joy. Um, and we've got another question. This may be you or maybe Ashley or Peter, but Joy, I'll give you first crack at this one. Has DAV looked into adult daycare being available to veterans, or is this something that should be considered as a resolution at a department level? Yeah, Shane, let me let me start that and see if, if they want to jump in. So it, it, when you look at the long-term care options, they range all the way from the institutional care at the facilities I talked about uh, down to home-based models of care. And there's a number of programs in there. One of those is adult day health care which is essentially a way to provide in-home care to, to a veteran on a day basis, um, or to bring them into a VA facility or a state home facility, for example, so that the care, uh, caregiver can have the day essentially freed up and they can uh, get care for the day inside a facility. Um, there are, uh, it is, they don't sleep overnight, but they're basically there during the day and they can be there depending on their need from one, two, three, up to five times a week. 
Um, the VA does provide support for this. They do provide it in state veteran homes. Uh, we do support more and more models of non-institutional care um, for those veterans who have options to be able to stay in the home if they can get support whether it's this option to be able to bring in their loved one, for example, a couple of times a week so they can get, sometimes it's just a matter of getting them bathed, you know, um, that is very difficult to do at home. Um, other times while they're there, they can get their medications checked, they can get various therapies and so forth. So we are supporting that and we're supporting some other models in between. One of those we call medical foster homes. So this is a model that rather than a large uh, institutional facility, there are people who want to provide uh, care with smaller facilities, sometimes at, in a home where they can take care of three to five to seven veterans and give them that support. Um, they also get licensed um, in the same way and are subject to all the same inspections. And I will take this opportunity just to comment on something I did see. I saw Joe put, did put in a comment and there is concern about what's being done to control uh, state uh, uh, VA and state home nursing care in regard to infection control, for example. And while there are individual instances where there are problems, understand that infection control is a regular part of what VA inspects, what CMS inspects for those state homes that are also Medicaid supported, what VA CLC does and what the community homes do. Remember every year they've got to fight the flu. Again, while the flu for a lot of people is not a major problem, in a nursing home with elderly people with, with a lot of conditions, flu season is a regular battle each year. So there are certainly uh, significant protocols uh, in VA facilities and state home facilities. And if they were doing them in medical foster homes, they would have to meet the same infection control. Can there be improvement? Of course. Are there instances where there are problems? Undoubtedly, but by and large, these facilities do do a pretty good job. Thank you very much, Peter. And actually, actually, we have a question um, that's in your space, as they say. Um, what is the current update on phase two for the caregiver expansion? All right. Thanks, Shane. And I might um, look to Peter to, to back me up on some of this if I don't cover it all. Um, but uh, it's a good question. And um, there has been some movement. Peter and I have, have been deep in discussions on, um, on this issue. So um, even just in the past week, we've um, held some meetings with a few of the other um, VSOs to start gauging support for a push to expedite that second phase, which again is um, May 7th, 1975 through uh, September 11th. So um, we've gotten some good feedback so far. It seems like there's definitely support within that community to, to make that push. Um, so we have kind of a couple next steps. Um, first, we need to get a feel for how the program is currently working under the phase one expansion. Um, so it, that's looking to see if we can have a, you know, if there can be a hearing to get that feedback from VA, what's working and what's not. Um, what do they still need as far as staffing and funding, et cetera. Um, and then from there, we can start to address those things and determine the feasibility of initiating phase two. Um, we also um, had, like I said, held a couple meetings last week um, with the staffs for Senator Patty Murray, who, um, as you know, was, was a, a champion for the caregiver issue and um, for, with um, the staff from uh, Senator Gary Peters' office who actually introduced the Team Caregiver Act, uh, which among other things called for VA to, to choose whether they would opt in or opt out of sending decision notification letters for that comprehensive caregiver program after a veteran had applied. Um, and Peter, you can correct me on the on the time frame there. I know it was 60 days from the implementation, um, and we're we're coming up on on that deadline for VA to make that determination of whether they will opt in or opt out. So we're going to be engaging with them to see if they've made a decision as of yet, um, and and if they have not made that decision, um, certainly we will encourage them not to opt out of of sending those notifications. So, long story short. Um, you know, while we were very happy uh, to see that severely ill veterans would now be included in um, the eligibility for that program, um, which is a change from what it was before, it was just, you know, severely um, injured veterans, um, and that phase one expansion uh, did begin this past October, albeit a year late. Um, this issue isn't over for us. So implementation of the provisions within the Team Act and certainly um, 
you know, if at all possible expansion of that phase two, um, we want to see that expedited, um, which would be October 1st of this year, which was the original date that we, we anticipated it would happen, again, because VA did not um, certify their IT system in a, a, a timely manner that we believed it, it should have been done, which would have put the um, initial expansion of phase one on October 1st, 2019. As we said, it was a full year late, so October 1st, 2020 was when it did um, open up to World War II, Korean era, and Vietnam uh, era veterans. So that two-year gap is, is what they had originally set. So that phase two should begin uh, this October, uh, but as it currently stands, uh, it's it's looking like it will be October 1st, 2022. So that's that's what we're trying to do is, is look to get that expedited up to this October. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ashley. Oh. Shane, you're on mute. I accidentally muted you, Shane. Sorry. I know. Oh. Somebody else muted me. I know I'm a talker. I know I'm a little loud. I get that. But if you mute me, I'm just going to you know, log off and call it a day. But, Joy, we have another question um, for you, and then I got a few more for Peter. Um, Joy, what? What is the uh, House and Senate Veterans Affairs plans this year on improving mental health and suicide prevention efforts? Thanks, Shane. Um, so as most of you probably are aware, there uh, were two major pieces of legislation passed last, uh, just at the very end of the 116th Congress, the Compact Act and the John Scott Hansen uh, uh, bill in coming out of the Senate. So both of those, there's going to be, from what we understand, um, a focus on making sure that those uh, provisions in there get implemented. Um, there were a lot of things related both to suicide prevention efforts and uh, VA's men uh, mental health services in general, just improving access, improving staffing, timeliness to getting um, mental health services. And one of the things that both the House and Senate Veterans Affairs Committee worked on uh, that was included in that legislation is access to um, care through community partnerships. So trying to prevent uh, suicide and veterans crisis that are related to other issues like maybe um, you know, a divorce, loss of their home, loss of their employment, then loss of their home and other things. So um, they're going to be uh, working with, there's going to be grants that will be uh, authorized for some community partners who also are also gonna do some work in the community so that veterans who are not using the VA healthcare system um, to see if they can capture them there, direct them to VA if needed, or provide services in the community. So that will be, they have told us, you know, a bulk of their time will be spent on just uh, looking at that. Um, you know, it will continue to be a, a, a priority issue, though. I mean, they want to see these rates of suicide among veteran population start to decrease, and they're looking for these other ways that, that um, they can be addressed. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Joy. We did have a question about when those were going to be implemented, and I think that kind of takes care of uh, both of those based on your comments. So thank you very much. Peter, I got a question for you. Understanding that we're still waiting on the market assessment um, and that they have called for comments in Section 203 of the Mission Act or the AIR Act, cybersecurity and the federal government has had a number of issues with agencies being attacked due to a third party. Is there an attempt to address this with respect to community care providers in the network who will be exchanging veterans health record information and will this have an impact on the Air Commission as well? Wow, what a question, Richard. Um, uh, um, it's, it's actually an extremely interesting question and one that I think is well-timed. We actually have, uh, next week, we'll be having a consultation with uh, uh, Dr. Stone, who's continuing as the Acting Undersecretary for Health. Um, there might be an opportunity to ask this question. Uh, your point is, is well-made. Um, we've, you know, we've seen the, the, the big cyber hack, you know, that occurred several months ago or we discovered several months ago um, to all sorts of the parts of the federal government. We've heard about potential cyber hacks to 
our utilities and our power grids and all sorts of things. So the question becomes, what is the what is the level of safety that VA is requiring of partners in the community in terms of cybersecurity? Um, and that will matter not just exchanging uh, personal information, but also, you know, for uh, veterans, make sure that they're as well protected internally through HIPAA as they are when they go outside the VA firewall. So I don't have a good answer to are they protected? I think it's a, a good issue to bring forward um, to look at it. I, I will just add a small comment to the, um, again, as you're aware, Richard, and others talking about that the um, part of the Mission Act, which was to strengthen the VA healthcare system, was also to perform an asset and infrastructure review uh, to look over where all of the VA hospitals, uh, you know, 172 medical centers, 1,240 odd uh, outpatient clinics, and a number of other facilities. What is their current condition? Um, what needs to be done in terms of, of repairing, rehabilitating them? Uh, are they located in the proper locations of VA facilities for the next 10, 20 years? Um, do they need to be realigned? And how will this work um, both with community care? But the question we've started putting forward is what should healthcare delivery look like in a post pandemic world, assuming we ever get there? Um, so these are all part of what's an asset infrastructure review that started and uh, under that law will take place over the next couple of years. The first step is federal register comments due back on May 1st, looking at criteria by which VA will measure, in their opinion, what facilities need to be expanded, uh, repaired, replaced, or potentially uh, realigned, or even potentially closed. So that is the first step. We do have concerns. It's part of what we put forward in our uh, if, you, if you've been able to see the videos online um, that we have on the critical issues, if, if you haven't, certainly commend you to them on our midwinter uh, 2021 webpage. And maybe Ashley or Shane could put that in the chat so everybody could have just a quick, a quick correct, uh, direct access to it. So we do have concerns about the asset infrastructure, infrastructure review that it's done properly. And uh, we're concerned they're, they may be rushing it now, not taking into account the delays that COVID has caused and the delay in rolling out the Mission Act. As someone asked the question, how long does it take to roll out a law? So given that we are looking to make certain that the timeline on that is proper, we think it needs to be pushed back a year. If we don't get that right, if you don't have bad data and bad uh, uh, if you have bad data, bad analysis going in, you're going to come out with bad results. So if we want to do that right. And it is important if we're going to properly fund VA, if we're ever going to get the right funding for construction and for VA infrastructure, it'll be because we have a long-term plan that was adopted with real input from all the stakeholders. So, so great question, Richard. Uh, um, I think a good thing would be let's, let's have the same conversation a couple months from now. Hopefully that'll be some more information we can dig out on that. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. And Richard, thanks again for the question. Jeremy, um, I got a question for you as we've kind of gone through all of the benefits and healthcare questions up to this point. We've got a few more in, and this one is for you, sir. Now that the SBP DIC offset has been eliminated and the DIC remarriage age has been lowered from 57 to 55, will DAV continue to focus on these benefits? or will we be shifting our attention to other survivors' benefits? Uh, well, you know, especially since, you know, SPP DIC isn't technically gone completely away yet. Um, you know, it's just the beginning. We will still, you know, press as much as we can if the opportunity ever arises to make that an immediate end to that offset. Um, if you look at that, uh, well, let me just focus in on the the lowering of the remarriage age from 57 to 55, and then you know the the slow removal of the SPP DIC uh, offset. Uh, first of all, you know we are, of course, I like we've we've said uh, ad nauseum. I think is you know we are a resolutions based organization, and our resolution specifically states about the SPP DIC offset that you know one we. Uh, you know, we urge Congress to remove it, and if it is ever removed, that we will, uh, we will then look to remove the six-year limitation on signing up for SBP. There was a lot of people who were told, and uh, at that time, that it was either or that there was going to be an offset, and that if you didn't sign up for it at that time, you know, you had that six-year period 
Well, the circumstances have changed now and we will uh, continue to advocate that folks can re-sign up for the SBP program now that there is no longer an offset. So there's that. The lowering of the remarriage age, same thing. Uh, you know, we are extremely happy that now that there is, um, you know, parity between, you know, federal uh, employee benefits and uh, DIC that, you know, if you get married at, uh, you know, below the age of 57, you know, at, at 55, then you still would retain the DIC. You know, that's a great win for us. It's something that we've been going for for a long time. However, our resolution doesn't give a time period. It doesn't give an age limit. And we will continue to advocate, you know, for a lower remarriage age, you know, and uh, look for that, in, you know, maybe in the, in the near future that, you know, we will be advocating for, you know, um, different ways to, to accomplish that. But of course, yes, I mean, you know, we're, we're very happy, but we're not going to rest on our laurels. There's still, you know, the 10-year uh, the time period for DIC eligibility that we will continue to hammer down on. There is also, you know, the, the increasing of the DIC benefit. And, uh, you know, we don't think that it is a survivable, you know, um, uh, compensation benefit. We, we think that that definitely needs to get fixed. And then, of course, there are the other survivor benefits that we're going to be focusing on now that have to do with COVID and, uh, you know, the, uh, the medical opinions and searching for those, for those who service-connected veterans who die of uh, the coronavirus. And then, you know, uh, the dependents uh, educational assistance, you know, Chapter 35, the assistance with that and taking away that delimited date permanently, you know, we still got a lot of things to, uh, to work on. Um, I wouldn't say that we're going to be focusing on one more than the other, you know, but look forward to it in the, in the, the near future. You know, we're hoping that there's going to be some bills that are coming out um, really, really soon. That's going to address a lot of these issues. So. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for taking care of that question. I'm going to address something really quick and then we'll get into a few more questions. Um, I saw a little bit of this in the chat box and I know this is on everybody's mind. Well, they passed the law writing the three presumptives for Agent Orange. Why haven't they started making decisions yet? Anybody have that question? No one? Oh, all right. Department of South Carolina cares. The rest of you guys are sleeping. Jim Shuey, I saw you. So this is what's going on. And if anybody is familiar with what happened the last time, in 2010, they added three new presumptive diseases to Agent Orange. And I'm just going to tell you this up front. It took 10 months from the time they made the announcement to the time they got the um, regulations updated and, and the ability to start granting benefits. Now, that was in 2010. VA has just said that what they're doing right now, any claim for hypothyroidism, bladder cancer, or Parkinson's-ism related to Agent Orange, they are being deferred. They are not denying those claims right now. They are deferring them for more information about how they need to proceed with promulgation. If they can grant any of those three diseases on a direct basis, not as a presumptive to Agent Orange, they will. But they are deferring all of those decisions at this time. And again, I believe it's because they're going to have to wait until they get regulations or authority from the secretary to go ahead and give them the authority to start making those decisions because I'm with you. There are so many veterans with those three conditions. And you look at bladder cancer, many veterans with it don't have a lot of time. So the quicker they can get to promulgating these decisions, the quicker it'll be for everybody to get access to benefits in healthcare. So I agree. So we've got that and that's the current state of play. We just got that information actually Friday because we've been asking a lot over the last month and a half, as you can imagine. We've even heard stories that VA were denying those three benefits because the law wasn't enacted yet and put into regulation. Now, I believe that was just a vicious rumor. We haven't seen any of that within DAB's represented veterans, but they are currently deferring those cases for the time being. So I'm gonna go ahead and shift gears to a another healthcare related question. And actually, I believe this one is gonna be for you. And I see you've got somebody helping you uh, answer the question right now, which is probably good. And that is DAV's new 
critical policy goal just doesn't include women veterans, but underserved veterans and minority groups. What is the AV specifically doing for rural veterans and Native American veterans and tribal veterans as far as access to access to the internet, access to telehealth, and just access for benefits? Yeah, so that definitely, as you mentioned, um, the, the expansion of our critical policy goal to include um, not just women veterans, but also those underserved populations, um, uh, racial and ethnic minority veterans, as well as um, LGBT uh, veterans as well. So we're, we're looking across the board at um, a number of different factors and asking VA to kind of dig in and take a look at um, some of the cultural barriers that may exist. Like you mentioned, if there's, if there's location, if there's access issues, um, things like that. Um, we're asking VA to, to make sure that they're doing a better job collecting data. Uh, we actually did happen to unearth a, a report um, the other day that sort of goes through a number of those, um, uh, it, it kind of breaks down by gender, um, by race, uh, the, the different outcomes uh, and disparities that may exist across the board within uh, healthcare for VA. And so we're taking a look at that. We're encouraging, as per the, the critical policy goal for VA, to um, do a better job collecting that data, analyzing that data, and identifying um, areas where they can improve. Um, Joy may have a, a few other comments as well on, on more specifics of, of um, what they're looking to do, but um, I did want to mention too, there was a, a bill that was just introduced. It's it's somewhat covering that ground, but also um, it's an, an I know, we'll go to the basement in a second. Um, something that I, I think it kind of talks a little bit about um, mental health care and uh, suicide prevention. And um, specifically looking at how we do outreach to those populations that are underserved, that, that the outreach may not be as strong and looking at how we can uh, facilitate that messaging better to those communities and make sure that they have access to the resources that they need when it comes to mental health care and suicide. Um, so Joy, did you have anything else you might wanna add there too? I would just add um, that there was the COVID, um, I mean, excuse me, the genomic, um, VA just uh, put out a press release on their new, um, within the Million Veterans Program, their genomic database, they're going to do a special project now looking at, because they have the most diverse genomic uh, database, they're going to be looking specifically at outcomes for minority veteran populations. So this is exciting. This is exactly what we've been asking for. And, um, you know, VA's been following these things and got a lot of raw data. Now it's sort of putting it all together and what can be done in terms of, like Ashley said, communications, um, but for proving, um, improving access, where are those um, barriers, whether it be how they communicate, cultural barriers, language barriers. I mean, there's just a number of things that can cause um, you know, this disconnect. And we found that the high rates of service-connected disa disabled veterans that use VA in both minor and various minority populations, they're high users of VA healthcare. So that's why we think it's, it's, it, it is extremely important for VA to be a real leader on that. So, yeah, and, I, and just one last thing in the rural or underserved communities, um, we're starting to see um, these partnerships with various other businesses um, and even veteran service organizations where they have locations where people can come if they don't have access in their rural area. It might be just a little bit closer than going to a VA, but you know, a Walmart or various um, locations where they're going to try to set up these access points for um, telehealth or, you know, um, other functions that if they're if they have issues with broadband. Thank you, Joy, and that is a very good point. Several VSOs, uh, veterans organizations across the country are setting up points for that telehealth, as well as Walmarts around the country are setting up and becoming available too. So there are a lot of options because yes, there are a lot of veterans in rural communities, uh, like where I uh, come from in the great uh, land of corn. Hey, John, go big red. 
And so there is always an access issue. And then when you look at Native Americans, it sometimes becomes even harder when there aren't a lot of resources and if they're farther away from the communities. So we're going to have time just for a couple of more questions. Um, and Peter, I have one for you, sir. Um, and that is, what is being done about doctors who were let go from the VA, but have gone out and now have contracts with the VA? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, good question, very timely. I, I suspect the person, uh, I think as Joe asked, it saw that there was a GAO report uh, that just came out, uh, generated a couple of stories about healthcare providers um, who were disqualified from providing care in VA, but may be able to find their way through one of the community contracts or the community providers as part of the network with TriWest or Optum. So that was something that was anticipated in the Mission Act when that was being brought uh, to Congress and passed, was how to make certain that if someone is disqualified from practicing medicine in VA, that we make sure that they don't then turn up inside a community provider's office, um, which goes around it. So that what the GEO report found was a couple things. Uh, one was that this is primarily a question of working through the two major uh, uh, what they call third party administrators, uh, that's TriWest and Optum. And they're required to make certain that every one of the providers that they credential to be part of the, the veteran care networks that they operate um, has a, a valid license and has not been disqualified. What they found was that in, in some cases, while uh, the a clinician might apply to be part of the network, and I think it might have been uh, one or both of the uh, two big uh, uh, Optum and TriWest, if they were licensed in the state of Nebraska, for example, since Big Red is out there, uh, to provide community care, that they were only checking had they ever been uh, lost their license or had uh, other uh, issues in Nebraska, rather than checking all 50 states. So GAO identified a vulnerability, which was that they may have lost their license uh, to practice in, again, Florida, but they showed up in California as part of a local uh, community care network. So that's one issue. The other issue was how often they were checking. Um, so they would run essentially this report on all of their providers, but then there could be a gap in between. So the GAO report just came out. Uh, I actually haven't read the whole thing. I had uh, taken a look at the summary. Uh, it's something that we'll be looking at to see what else is needed. Clearly, there is uh, steps needed to, to tighten this up. Um, so it is a, a good topical question. It's something we'll be following up on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. I really appreciate it. And I think we've got time just for a couple of more. Um, it looks like we've got the first one from the great state of Alabama. And that is, uh, Joy, I think this might be for you. Something that may be of help specifically on veteran suicide issues is all the work that is currently being done by, I don't know what your acronym means, Chad. When you give me six, six letters, I don't know what that means. So we'll call it the S-A-M-H-S-A -S -S through the governor's challenge on veteran suicide. So I'm not really sure what the specific question is since we're not familiar with that program because it sounds like it's specific to Alabama. But Joy, um, is there anything that you can provide on um, other programs are looking at to help with that? Yes, and so that's that stands for uh, SAMHSA, um, the state and mental health services. Anyway, um, specifically on veteran suicide issues is all the work currently be done, uh, the governor's challenge. Something that may be of help specifically. So I, I know with um, this outreach is far and wide. So it's a really a public health model that VA is adopting on the suicide prevention efforts with grants. And I know they're working with other federal partners, state partners, local entities. Um, so I think the door is open um, to all comers, you know, who are interested in trying to. Um, you know, support support that mission. VA is going to be going through and looking at those the grants that you know requests that come in. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me that they would be you know 
working with SAMHSA, who obviously is, you know, uh, an established person in the community, you know, in the states and the communities. Thank you very much, Joy. And uh, I don't know that we're going to have an awful lot of time left, but there is one issue I wanted to address real quick. There was a, a comment or a question in there specific to uh, proposals to reduce veterans benefits from a CBO score in 2018. Richard, not concerned about 2018. Well, why is that you're thinking? Well, Richard, they came out with a new report in December of 2020. So CBO comes out with the risk court uh, report. CBO is the Congressional Budgetary Office. They're a bipartisan agency within Congress. And every two years, they come out with a new report that's called deficit reduction measures. So these aren't laws, these aren't bills. These are options for the federal government to save money. And guess where they look? Oh my God, you're right. Veterans benefits. They look at veterans benefits. And in the recent report from 2020, and I'm just going to touch on some of those real quick. This is part of our critical policy goal for 2021. If you haven't checked out our critical policy goals, you should go to the link for midwinter. The critical policy goals are there, as well as we talk about this in the video. One of the first recommendations CBO is making to save money is we need to eliminate IU for all veterans who reach the age of 67. That's right. It's time to get rid of all you freeloading veterans who don't want to work and just take money once you hit retirement age. Now, of course, this is a horrible idea, and it's arbitrary. And here's why it's a very arbitrary idea. All they're saying is, if you meet the age of 67, which is social security, social security retirement age, that means you have other options, okay? How many veterans do you know aren't entitled to social security retirement benefits because they've been on IU so long and haven't worked that there is nothing in there for them that they're eligible for? Anybody know veterans like that? I know a ton of veterans like that. Or they've never had a job in the civilian world long enough to get a pension or a retirement from a civilian place, right? I know lots of veterans like that too. So this idea is purely, purely monetary savings. There's no other logic behind it. Now, ask me, Shane, what's the average age of members in, of Congress? <laughs> I earned 67. Um, so uh, they're going to decide that veterans should stop getting benefits and work at 67, but some of them are in their 80s. Just saying, doesn't quite sound right. One of the other ideas in that CBO report, are you ready? If a veteran's only 10 or 20%, they want to stop paying them benefits. Period. 30% and higher are all those who should get a payment. The rest of you that are just getting your 10 and 20%, whatever. That was one of the recommendations in the CBO report. And the reason I bring these up is not because they're being introduced into law. We need to be aware of these things because these ideas do find their way in conversations on the Hill. The IU issue was a part of the former President Trump's budget proposal in 2018 to reduce IU on veterans at the age of 65. That's why we need to be mindful of these. One of the other ideas they have is uh, how many retired veterans are out there right now uh, on this call? Who's a retiree? Completely retired. Well, one of their ideas is once you hit retirement age, reduce all of your VA benefits by 30%, period. And I'm sure you guys are okay with that. You don't need that extra 30%, right? Oh, you do. See, these are the horrible ideas that are out there. And one more that I'm going to share with you, and this, this, this is the, uh, the cherry on top. They want to make all VA compensation and pension payments taxable. The proposal to remove tax-free status on VA compensation and pension, because it's more important that we save them a few bucks on veterans' benefits on our backs than anywhere else. So, Richard, I know you asked about the 2018 report. We're talking about the 2020 report because some of those proposals overlap, but some of them are even more disturbing, especially the if you're only 10 or 20 percent, you're not going to get paid anymore. Or when you retire, we're automatically going to take 30% of your pay, your compensation, which 
one has nothing to do with the other, not even close. These are the things we're trying to make part of our agenda for 2021 in protecting veterans benefits and claims. So um, I'm not going to take any more questions at this point. Um, if you have questions, remember, our contact information is available on the website for midwinter. There's a link in there for our information. So if there's additional questions you have, please let us know. I want to thank you all for coming. I know it wasn't quite the same banter we get at midwinter with us standing in the hallway and or standing out in the smoke pit, um, for those of you who smoke, um, and share a, a Jeff laugh and a joke and talk about benefits. So before we close out, I want to pass this over to our legislative director and uh, let Joy close this out with any additional comments uh, for everybody. And again, thank, thank you all for attending. I hope you found this informative. Thanks. Thanks so much for moderating, Shane. Uh, I hope everybody got at least one question answered, but if not, uh, please, as he noted, um, please check out the uh, webpage for Midwinter. You're gonna find all kinds of resources there. We taped videos of each critical priority goal, um, our critical priority goals uh, legislatively for the 117th are up there. You can print a copy. Um, we've got our contact information, so lots of information too, and, and the presentations for our OPA award winners, our outstanding performance and advocacy, and one of the congressional awards so, for, so, for, um, so far. So we thank Ashley and her team for helping coordinate that this year, um, and we hope you guys will take a look at it. And remember, we still need to make sure we're advocating for um, you know, our legislative goals for this year. And so, although it's gonna be done virtually, we know our members, all of you are gonna be the lead on that. And you're gonna share this with uh, departments and chapters. And I think um, Ashley and I were just going back and forth. We're hoping to be able to post uh, the video so others can listen to the questions and answers, but you all have a good evening. Thanks for joining us and we will see you soon. We'll be having our webinar calendar uh, set up uh, shortly and putting those out so you can set some dates aside for um, additional uh, times to meet with the legislative team. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah.